Hey everybody, it is Monday and uh, we're out in the vineyard finally. Uh, I'm going to uh, kind of break away again from our five questions. If you have questions about viticulture, winemaking, anything, you can always send them to me via Twitter at Wes Hagen uh, or Clopepe at Wes at Clopepe.com or on any of our Facebook pages. But today I thought we would back up a little bit and start at the beginning. And I'm going to give you sort of my speculations on the origin of the grapevine. This comes from reading Dr. Patrick McGovern's Ancient Wine, Dr. Patrick McGovern's Uncorking the Past, as well as John Hager's North American Pinot Noir. Looking at all of these different, all, I also read a book called A History of the World in Six Glasses. So this is sort of a combination of reading all these things, being a full-time viticulturist for 19 years, and considering where did the grapevine come from, and what does it mean uh, to the humanity, to humanity and the history of mankind, and w what's really going on with the grapevine. So here we go. Um, 200 million years ago, there was one continent. That continent separated into the, into the major uh, continents that we recognize today. At that point, there was really only one grapevine. That grapevine was Vitus ampullosus. Uh, Vitus ampullosus began going through genetic mutations in these various places and generally became the American, European, and the Asian subspecies of grapes. In China, in the village of Jiahu, uh, pottery shards were discovered in, uh, that were carbon dated back to 9600 BCE that showed tartaric acid on the interior of the crystal, uh, uh, crystals on the interior of the pottery shards. So we know that about 10,000 BCE, 12,000 years ago, people were carrying around jars, fired pottery in China that contained some type of alcohol that included grape juice. Now the Chinese were never that interested in making pure grape wine. Uh, perhaps that's the reason why they still mix Coca-Cola with much of their red wine. But these extreme beverages were rice and millet and honey and, and hawthorn fruit and grapes and all these things were combined into an extreme alcoholic beverage that was uh, probably as medicinal as it was delicious and intoxicating. So to get to European wine we have to move forward to 6500 BCE which is about the same time that pottery shards are discovered in the Transcaucasus between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea showing that somewhere People were firing pottery, filling it with grape wine, and trading it from village to village. So the, uh, the commerce of wine is over uh, about 9,000 years old in Europe. So during the, the mid-Neolithic or the late Neolithic periods, we're talking about periods where people were actually making wine, trading wine uh, in Europe, specifically in Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Some people also would include the Turkish highlands. Now, in that region, what enabled mankind to make wine is the last ice age receded, opened up the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea for human habitation. And as humans went into this area, what they found was delicious fruit and nut trees growing everywhere. And parasitizing these nut and fruit trees were these grapevines that would hang these gorgeous jeweled clusters of fruit. Now, humans would have seen birds eating this fruit. Birds, uh, humans would have seen squirrels eating this fruit and other animals. And some of these birds and squirrels would actually wait for the fruit to ferment on the vine, would eat fermented grapes and fall drunk out of these trees. So some people think that in general, uh, we imitated drunk animals in, our, in learning how to make wine. I don't really believe that. I believe that human beings brought grapes back to, uh, back to their villages, put them in stone basins, and as they ate this fruit, once in a while it would get a little old and they wouldn't finish the fruit and it would begin to sort of rot and get kind of wet and sloppy at the bottom of this stone. And then as they, uh, uh, someone decided after they saw the magic bubbling happen, they would taste this fruit and say, wow, there's something going on there. It changes my perspective from sort of mundane and sober to a little uh, you know, more intoxicated and heavenly. So that Paleolithic Eucharist really was the first time that wine was probably uh, uh, tasted from those grapes in Europe. Uh, in, in, in a way that would have been considered semi-modern. Why I call it semi-modern is that same culture developed and found a hermaphroditic vine in, the, uh, in this area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, somewhere near a village called Zagros, and uh, right in the Black Mountains in the Transcaucasus. When they learned about that stuff, what they were able to do is they could take the hermaphroditic vine and domesticate it. So after we have domesticated the, uh, the European grapevine, Vitus vinifera sylvestris became Vitus vinifera vinifera. We had the hermaphrodite vine that would produce 10 times as much fruit as a female, and of course the male vines produced no fruit. So the hermaphrodite was a really key uh, thing to getting us thinking about how to make wine into a culture. So the village of Zagros by 5500 BCE was producing 200,000 liters of wine a year. That's 50,000 gallons. Same production as Robert Mondavi Napa in 2005. So how did they get there? Well, first of all, they had the hermaphrodite vine. They were making massive amounts of wine in underground clay bunkers because they didn't have 
uh, anything large enough to keep that volume of wine in, and keeping it under the ground kept it cool. So being underground, having things you could put underground was a great way to sort of uh, insulate wines when they were young. So this first wine culture, really, the European wine culture in the Transcaucasus around the 6th millennia BCE, led to a development of the uh, domesticated hermaphrodite vine. That vine was passed around the Transcaucasus, passed around Turkey and Asia Minor, passed around the Middle East, down into Egypt. Egypt is burying King Tut pretty soon with vineyard designated, winemaker designated, jars of wine for the afterlife. 1500 BCE in Greece, we create a wine, the Greeks create a wine that's so expensive that a 15 gallon amphora trades uh, for a team of 30 oxen. That's very, very expensive booze. That culture, once the Greeks had developed it, the Greeks did a couple things with wine, like inventing democracy, you know, inventing philosophy. Um, all of these things became very important to the Greek symposia, where landed gentry would sit around drinking wine and discussing these things, which became the basis of, uh, you know, of, uh, of democracy. Uh, having a discussion in a group of people, and of course the drinking would allow them to become more passionate about what they were saying. They would never get drunk, but they would never be sober. So these discussions were probably a little bit quicker and more decisive than anything we would see in, in the Senate or the Congress today. Sometimes I wonder if a drink in Congress or a drink in Senate, not to say they don't have drinks during lunch, but it would maybe if it was actually allowed uh, within chambers, it would allow things to go faster. But anyways, the Greeks got it, then the Romans got jealous, and when the Romans got the wine culture, everywhere that the Romans went throughout Europe, they dropped off these different grapes which would mutate into the local varietals. For example, Treminer, gorgeous grape that's uh, grown in northern, uh, northern Italy. Uh, it was taken over the Alps into Germany, and the cool climate produced a lot more terpenes, and as they kept certain, uh, certain uh, plants from, from, vinti from, uh, from vineyard to vineyard, replanting the vines, they noticed that the Treminer picked up a very spicy character, so it became the word for German, uh, in, in spicy in German is Gewurz, so Gewurz Treminer became the spicy version of Treminer as it was genetically mutating and changing due to climate. So literally every grape that is of European heritage today, from Arnais to Zinfandel, came from one hermaphroditic vine that emerged from the Transcaucasus almost 9,000 years ago. So as we look at the genetics of any grape, we can trace it back to see how close it is to that original red grape. All, all grapes in nature are red because as a bird looks for something to eat, it will ignore uh, green grapes and go right for the red grapes. That color pigment is actually a visual indicator to the birds that the fruit is sweet enough to eat and it has a seed that's viable enough to be spread. So the vines have this little trick of turning their grapes red to entice birds to eat them. Bird goes to a different part of the forest, goes to the bathroom, seed drops in some beautiful fertilizer, and that's the way grapevines expand their sort of their natural boundaries. But really the Romans did a better job than the, than the birds spreading grapevines throughout Europe. And everywhere they dropped them off, whether it was Spain, Germany, uh, you know, Italy, France, anywhere that the Romans went, I think that you saw that those local varieties, the locals after the Romans left decided, well, the kind of wine we want to grow is X. So they allowed the random genetic mutations of those vines to change until the vine was perfect. Then they used those vines to replant their vineyards over and over. And that's the way grape vines developed. That's the way the grape vines went throughout Europe. I think next week we can talk a little bit about the movement of European grape vines into the new world and how the new world plays into the history of wine. But as of right now, you have 200 million years of history uh, from the first uh, Pangaea all the way through the Romans. So maybe next week we'll do uh, maybe next week we'll do sort of the Romans to uh, uh, to Pasteur, and then maybe another week we'll do Pasteur uh, till tomorrow. So thank you very much for listening. Send those questions in if you have them. And until then, keep drinking good Pinot Noir.